good afternoon. And I know that everyone is probably getting very hungry and very tired of sleep. So I wanted to just start by uh, thanking, of course, Chin, who I, I really should pronounce, I think, Chin, <laughs> and Chin, and uh, Stephanie, who both have done a marvelous job in setting this up. And I always think that Chin should start his talk with the video of hurting cats, because we had a lot of opinions that we had to bring in on the standard of care document, and it was really very fun and uh, a very enjoyable process. Um, I think I also uh, wanted to just get a quick canvas of who I'm talking to today. So how many of you are parents in general? Just raise your hand. I'm a parent. So, okay, so we have a little bit of insight just as parents how difficult raising children is. And how many of you are parents of a child with SMA? So there's probably maybe 20% of the group in here. I raised my hand just as an example. I don't have a child with SMA. But we all have many children and we're doctors taking care of them. Um, and how many of you are therapists? Okay, uh, of any kind, respiratory. And how many of you are other medical professionals, doctors or nurses. Great. So uh, it sounds like that's actually the largest group is the doctors and nurses. So welcome everybody uh, to this talk. So our talk um, is actually rehabilitation, not just physical therapy and orthopedics. And Kristen Crochelle, who you'll meet uh, again later this afternoon, and I work on these slides together. So we just wanted to keep it as calm as possible and not so much speakers back and forth, but you'll be seeing a lot more of her this afternoon. The objectives of my talk today are to learn more about the problems that require rehabilitation and orthopedic care in this disease. We'll also review the BC before consensus, uh, a little bit about what we knew at that time. We'll also talk about what were the findings of our group and how we uh, we got to consensus, and then updating finally on information that is new since the standard of care uh, publication. So this is the AC after consensus. Our task force members were almost all physical therapists. Uh, Kristen Crochelle, again you'll meet her, our lonely occupational therapist, Joanne Maxilski, and Julian Florence, Alan Glansman, Richard G. from various institutions. And we did have one uh, parent advocate, Jill Jurecki, on our group. The co-leaders were myself and Mary <coughs> Mays, who is our international colleague, um, and who many of you have probably seen mostly in the work on outcomes that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and my background is actually, I started out as a pediatric physical therapist, so this is always in my heart when I look at children with different diseases. Um, also, I served on an American Academy of Neurology subcommittee for what we call uh, the QSS, Standard, standard uh, Subcommittee, in which we develop practice guidelines. So my orientation in this process was to review evidence and make recommendations based on evidence. Now that topic has come up in almost every talk, and here is the frustrating thing. There is almost no evidence for anything that we are doing in this disease. And um, unfortunately, we're relegated to expert opinion and consensus, because that is all we have. So we can't publish this as a any kind of standard as has already been mentioned. So take that, everything I say with a grain of salt, because it isn't true. Now before consensus, again, we, we had no high level of evidence. We had none in therapy measures. We had none for the use of orthotics, which almost every parent in this room, every therapist in this room uses extensively. And we had virtually nothing as far as high quality evidence any sort of double-blind, placebo-controlled anything in orthopedic surgery. So we had single case reports and small series of case reports that guided our thinking. Uh, there were no other consensus documents at that time on this topic either for any of the areas that are listed below. Our challenges were identified through the meeting that was referred to that the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke held in Washington, D.C. back in 2004. 
and Deborah Hertz, who is a child neurologist at the NIH, NINDS, summarized our findings in this document, which was published in the Neurology Journal. Um, we decided, as Chen said, to group everything in terms of function. So uh, for non-sitters at that point, we knew that they had limited spontaneous movements except for their hands and feet. So that's the classic proximal muscle weakness that we all talk about, which is certainly uh, important. It guides our thinking about what can our children with SMA type 1 or the non-sitters do. Another huge issue with them is positioning. So in what position are they most functional, and in what positions are they safest medically, and in what positions are they also the most comfortable? So pain is something we truly need to think about and avoid. How about mobility? So how do, how do they get from here to there? And um, how does the respiratory system, Mary's system, and Brenda's system, how do those relate then to our uh, utilization of therapeutic maneuvers and positioning. We'll talk about that more. And what about assistive devices? One of our biggest challenges, and all of you have seen something like this before, is scoliosis. So for our sitters, yes, they're able to get upright, but then gravity is our enemy. So we're constantly contending with the forces of gravity. And for unknown reasons, Patients with neuromuscular weakness tend to favor one side or the other. So they almost all will get what's called a C-curve scoliosis uh, illustrated here. And with that, there's also a big rotational component. And so you get protrusion of the ribs both posteriorly in the back and also in the front. And it causes a lot of discomfort. You can see here for this young woman, her ribs are sitting on her pelvis. So that can cause a lot of skin breakdown in the folds, and also just sometimes almost bone on bone. And also they're trying to put someone like this into a comfortable position in a chair is a huge challenge. For walkers, one of our big problems is their tendency to develop a spine that is exaggerated in what's called lordosis. So they have an increased curvature here. This little girl is going back and forth between an exaggerated lumbar lordosis and trying to correct that. The other component that follows them is this genu recurvatum, or back knee, hyperextension of the knee, and those tend to go together. In addition to other things for walkers, for example, tremor. A lot of our patients have significant tremor that interferes with their function. A waddling type gait, so that can cause a lot more energy expenditure with walking. And uh, finally, uh, two important Fs here, fatigue is very important, especially as patients get into adult years. And pain goes along with the fatigue, um, probably separate entities, and then falls. And so when we talk about bone density, we are really combining two very dangerous situations, patients who are not as stable as they um, hopefully could be with a decreased bone density and once they have fractures, that may be the last time they're able to really get around independently. 